hosting. Hey, we're live on the internet. Internet. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, hopefully, there's a few people watching here. My name is Justin Catroni. I'm the analytics advocate for Google. I work on the Google Analytics team. And uh, today, we're having a Google Analytics uh, hangout on air. We're broadcasting out uh, from our Google Plus page, and we're delighted to have John Lovett uh, join us. Uh, so for those of you that uh, know John, or if you work in the, uh, the digital analytics space or online marketing space, you've probably heard of John. Um, I actually have a quick little bio here for you, John, real professional like, tell everyone how awesome you are. Let's pull it up here and, and give us a little. So uh, here's a little bit about John. Uh, John Lovett, he's a senior partner at Web Analytics Demystified, a consulting firm focused on digital measurement and strategy. He has over 10 years of experience analyzing and evaluating web technologies. And since joining Web Analytics Demystified in 2009, John has uh, declared his quest to become a change agent for analytics by questioning the status quo of vendor measurement practices, challenging clients to fulfill, uh, to fully develop their strategic vision for measurement, and uh, driving the industry to collectively embark or uh, on advancement. So John is a change agent making things move forward. Um, he's also an author. He wrote uh, Social Media Metrics Secrets, which is a great book. Uh, it's a comprehensive guide to measuring social media, which is exactly what we want to talk about today. Um, and it's a total must read. And um, I've got a, a quote here. Uh, I've read it and uh, read it on my Kindle, and I've got a whole bunch of things highlighted. And this is one of my favorite quotes, John, in your book. The priority should be on demonstrability and producing results, not counting up fans and followers. No program of social media should exist without a means to quantify whether or not it's working. And by and large, organizations that rely solely on counting metrics are hard pressed to demonstrate value. Um, you wrote that. I'm like, I'm so excited to hear to talk about it. Talk about that stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting because you know so many so many companies that embark on on social media of any kind. Uh, their first questions out of the gate are, you know, how many people are listening, how many followers do we have, uh, really what ends up being superficial metrics. And, you know, I, I encourage them or press hard to say, well, what are you trying to get out of this? What's, you know, what's going to be the value for your enterprise, for your organization, and how can we start to take it beyond just looking at, you know, how big is your fan base or how many people are looking at your, you know, your, your web pages to, is it actually driving business for you? Are you able to quantify the results in terms of customer satisfaction? You know, really, where, where what are the objectives that you're working towards? And um, I've really built out, uh, since writing the book, I've built that out quite a bit to take that even further to say, you know, what are uh, desired outcomes that, that an organization might have, and how can you build a strategic measurement practice around that to really go further than just saying, you know, how many fans and how many followers. Now, how are some of those outcomes maybe different than, you know, outcomes you might have on the website, right? So the traditional online business models, like selling a product or generating a lead, you know, how, how do they vary? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, you know, the by and large, a lot of times on social media, you're, you're talking about pre-buying cycles or, you know, people aren't necessarily you know, considering products when they're uh, engaging on social media. So it's... You know, some people might call it high funnel activity where you're trying to generate awareness or simply talk about your products or services, but it's like, you know, you don't want to be pitched, you don't want to be sold on social media in a lot of ways when you look at, um, for people that are active on Twitter, let's say, you know, if you're watching a stream and watching a hashtag, uh, it's actually kind of annoying to see a uh, sponsored ads or, you know, recurring promotions for things. Uh, when you're just trying to use it as a channel to get news or information. So, you know, the, the whole concept of the sledgehammer approach of marketing, just saying, you know, here's the message, we're going to, you know, repeat it with consistency and frequency, um, that becomes, uh, it's not as effective in social media because people aren't necessarily there uh, to get those types of messaging. They're there for, um, you know, the content, they're there for the engagement, for the attitudes. So, you know, to, to your question, um, really, you know, the differences between a primary website, if somebody visits your site, they're trying to learn about you. They're trying to learn about what you're selling, what you have to offer, perhaps how much it costs, and if they can transact with you directly. 
I think at social media, it's more about, you know, can you generate the awareness? Can you facilitate some sort of engagement where you're actually getting them to either, you know, talk to you or tell you about what they want or participate in some way? Um, or other things too, maybe you're facilitating support and, and they've already bought from you and you need to actually continue the, the life stage and say, you know, we're going to support you and support our products using this channel as well. You know, I do think that the, the differences between social media and a primary website in terms of outcomes are, are very distinct. Can I ask a question? Of course. Sure. So John, uh, one thing that uh, I think is, is very interesting is how you choose which uh, network to focus your attention. That is better for each of, the, of, those, uh, of those actions or do you think that people should just make up research and, and then start focusing on whatever network? Yeah, you know, it, it, you know, like like many things, it, it depends. Um, Twitter has become a good channel to be able to do support uh, from a consumer's perspective, because a consumer can say, uh, "I'm sitting on the airplane right now. I can't believe some of the stewardess just spilled a drink on me, and there's no you know, chips or whatever." Uh, it's a it's an outlet for consumers to cry or to cry out and to and to be able to voice. Um, vent a little bit of their frustration. It's not so good if you're a brand to be able to respond in that way, but social media has come to a point where you almost have to respond uh, on those channels if consumers are venting there. Um, so, it, you know, by and large, Twitter is one of those channels where you need to be listening to just in case your consumers are there and asking questions. I think one of the proven channels um, is the, the, the forum style uh, engagement where users can uh, answer each other's questions. Usually you've got some type of moderator you know, that represents a, an organization or a brand um, to be able to chime in and, and have a voice of authority, if you will, about the, the products or services. Um, but that's proven to be, you know, you look at the classic examples of uh, my Starbucks idea and uh, Dell's idea storm and Verizon uh, has got a great page uh, where they have um, uh, consumers talking to other consumers. Uh, another telecom, uh, Telstra in Australia, has got um, a, a good site where they actually let users vote up um, different ideas to see which they're going to handle. And that's proven to be a very diplomatic method of um, letting consumer opinion rise to the top, having a somewhat structured uh, format by which to be able to, uh, to have conversations in. And somebody actually asked me a question last week. They said, you know, how do you deal with, um, if you open yourself up to take ideas from consumers, how do you deal with bad ideas? Or how do you deal with ideas that just aren't feasible and they're, they're not going to be something that your company is going to invest in? And my answer was, you know, let the community vote on it. And those types of, you know, forums or those types of places where consumers can say, yes, I love this idea, let, you know, please make it happen. And if you've got a substantial customer base that's telling you they want something, you know, to, to come to fruition, that's a pretty good indicator. And if, you know, on the other hand, if nobody votes for it, nobody thinks it's a great idea, that consumer says, okay, well, maybe that wasn't a good idea, and they don't feel rejected by the brand, that, you know, the, the, the community spoke. So, I mean, those are two channels. Everybody looks at Facebook because it's the most popular, and I tend to say Facebook isn't always right. You know, if you've got a niche site, if you're you know, depending on your industry, if you're um, a network of realtors, you know, maybe it's maybe it's a good place to go. If you're, you know, um, you know, bio biopharma industry, you know, Facebook might not be the place for you. Uh, it's very dependent on industry. It's very dependent on uh, where your audience is, and, and that's what I advocate for: is starting by finding your audience, and that just comes with listening. You know, you have to set up your outposts, listening outposts, and start to find out where the conversations are. You might figure out that you know some obscure blogs, uh, people are talking about your topics um, on a regular basis. Um, you know, Facebook is, you know, may or may not be that be that topic if you're a you know, brand like Gatorade or Pepsi, uh, maybe it is, but but in other cases, um, you might find other other channels that are more important. So that, that's a that's a really 
That's a really cool term you just used, listen, uh, listening outposts. And, and how, how would you go about setting up a listening outpost to try to track down some of these smaller, you know, these smaller places? I'm, I'm thinking, you know, if you're a giant enterprise or if you're a small business or a mid-sized business, um, sometimes it's hard to discover these small spots. The internet gets kind of, kind of big. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the and this kind of goes into one of the questions we had about, you know, how do you um, how do you measure mentions of your website or of your brand uh, on social media? And you know, it's kind of you start with, you know, before investing a lot of money in a social listening tool, you know, things like a Google Alert. You know, set up alerts for your brand, set up alerts for your competitors, set up alerts for your primary topics. And you have to get you do it once, find out how much noise there is in your alerts. Um, and then start to refine it to make sure that you're getting what you need. Um, I always use the example of you know, when, I, when I demoed all the social monitoring companies, um, they would have a keyword like Doritos. And they'd say, oh, let's look, at the, let's look at the mentions for Doritos. And they come up with a bunch of stuff, and it's all straight on topic, very relevant. They're talking about Doritos. They're talking about uh, the brand, the products, what they like and what they don't like. Now, that's easy because Doritos is pretty unique. It's only spelled one way, or even if you misspell it, it's, it's not that many variations. Um, people know that it's a product. It's actually a, a chip product. You know, if you've got um, a generic brand name or if your product is generic, you end up getting so much noise in there that you need to filter and filter and filter to be able to get to a relevant, relevant conversation or, or, or listening. So you know, in terms of setting up that listening outpost, the first thing is kind of starting with the wide net and then refining. And I take the same strategy with um, uh, when setting up social monitoring tools on behalf of my clients. Um, we say, what's the universe of keywords that we might want to pay attention to? And come up with a big spreadsheet that says, here's our branded keywords, here's our competitive keywords. Um, you know, really it's like a like a SEO strategy. And what are the keywords you're going to listen to? And then you ultimately end up cutting way back because as most of these tools work, the more you collect, the more you're going to pay. So, you know, what is most important to you? Let's start listening to those conversations and knowing where your tool pays attention to. So are they going to capture blogs? Are they going to capture mainstream PR? Are they going to capture, um, you know, comments in blogs? Uh, there's all sorts of different methodologies that listening companies use. So those are things you need to be aware of. You know, what are they going to capture? So once you once you start to find all of these little spots in all these places, um, what's next, right? And I, I'm assuming you need to kind of, you know, set some objectives. Like I, I need to grow my audience and I need to engage my audience. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how do you, how do you measure that? Yeah, yeah. So so I typically start with. Um, uh, you know, the, the, I call it the inside-out approach, and this goes back to the methodology that Jeremiah Ayang and I developed um, uh, going back a couple of years now. We've actually licensed it on Creative Commons, the, the framework that we did, because you really need to start with a goal. What's important to your business? And, um, you know, and oftentimes, you know, to use Jim Stern's goals, he has three goals. There's only three things that matter to a business, either saving money, making money, or driving customer satisfaction. And you know those can be the, the biggest goals that you have. You know if those are your goals, um, you know figuring out okay what are the precursors to making money. Well, first you need to make people aware of your products and services. So awareness might be a category that we're looking at. Uh, then you need to drive them to your retail outlets or to your you know uh, website or however you're ending up you know transacting with customers. So you need to be able to measure your calls to action. So what is the, what is the engagement factor? Uh, really looking at it from a perspective of what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Um, and then shifting that into a, a, an objective, a digital objective that you can accomplish with social media. And then starting to plan your campaigns and your activities around that. And, and that's why for me, uh, kind of back to your question, Daniel, the, the, the channel comes last. Because I'd rather say, what is it we're trying to do here? How are we gonna, you know, how is that gonna, how are we gonna equate it to our digital objectives, and then what are gonna, what's the execution of that? So that's typically the last, uh, the last piece that I start to think about is, okay, which channel? Because ultimately, you end up using multiple channels. So I mean, you look at any good social marketing campaign, um, you know, take the, uh, 
uh, going back to the U.S. Super Bowl, uh, Volkswagen, a week before the Super Bowl, they started running commercials about the, uh, the kid dressed up in the Star Wars costume. And you see the follows them through. And you know, before the Super Bowl commercial even aired, they had 10 million views on YouTube. So phenomenal ramp up to their actual awareness campaign. Uh, when the commercial aired, people knew what to expect, and it was still a good commercial to watch, even if you'd already seen the YouTube video. And they ended up doing a good job of generating awareness. Um, you know, you know that the product had a remote car starter. If you remember nothing about that commercial, you remember the remote car starter because that was the big aha moment for the for the child. But um, things like that usually end up being multiple channels. So you had YouTube, you had television. Um, you know, there were conversations going on. You know, across the blogosphere about the way that they were doing it. So it generated hype across not just one channel but multiple channels. So I know we had uh, we had a bunch of questions, and um, most of the questions actually were focused around uh, tools and what are you using today and um, uh, to to do measurement. And um, I would love to hear that. Right? It seems like there's there's something new or something. You know, the the measurement piece is evolving quickly. You know, everyone has a new service to measure retweets or whatever. What are some of the uh, What are you using today? Yeah, and and, and I'll, before I kind of jump into it, I'll just say that. Um, it's one of those things that's tough to keep up with because just like you say, you know, there's probably a new tool that emerges every week. I get I get emails and I get letters from companies that are saying, hey, we've got this new tool, will you check it out? Um, and I certainly do when I when I when I have the time, but um, keeping up with what's available is a constant challenge. Um, you need to you know you need to think about what your requirements are, and the better you can do a documentation uh, beforehand to kind of know what you're looking for, you know, the better off you're going to be. But um, I'm actually going to share my screen uh, quickly just to show you, um, to, sh to give you a glimpse of some of, the, some of the tools that I do use. And one of the things I wrote about in the book was I call it the social technology spectrum. So um, this is a blog post I wrote back uh, last year. Um, and it, it kind of, you know, this image right here is, is the technology spectrum. And I'm not sure how well that's showing. Is that showing up okay for you guys? That looks pretty cool, yeah. Okay, so I did this because um, essentially there are many different types of social media tools that you can use, and I put learn at the center of this of this uh, spectrum because, in my opinion, you know, learning is the most important objective that you can take on with social media. So, in terms of thinking about what it is you're trying to accomplish, you're always doing this so that you can learn something. But then from there, you know, I kind of had five categories. So the first one is discover. You know, you're trying to just listen. And, you know, really it's the equivalent of social search. So just going out there and trying to understand what's available in the marketplace. The next category that I talk about is analyze. And this is where I kind of put the social analytics vendors. So it's about not just listening and finding out what's out there, but looking at your the analytics behind it. So how many, you know, starting with accounting metrics and then evolving to business value metrics. Uh, really, how are you starting to analyze activity on your social platforms? The next category I talk about, and I'm going clockwise, by the way. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse movements, but uh, engaging. So either engagement or workflow. A lot of tools will do just listening. So they only say, you know, you can pick up your mentions or maybe you can do some analysis. But tools like Radiant 6 do a great job of, with their engagement console. So if you pick up a tweet or you pick up um, people that are talking about your brand, can you engage directly from your social monitoring tool or do you have to use another client? So you know, let's say you hear something on, on Twitter about your brand and you want to say, you know, respond to that person. Um, the difference between doing it from your engagement console where you can track the record, you can keep a, a profile perhaps of the individual or assign it to somebody else within your organization to respond to, that's different than going out to you know, Hootsuite or TweetDeck or even Twitter.com to be able to make your response. Um, so tools that, that build that in, have some sort of workflow process, are better for organizations that have multiple people managing their, their social media. From there, there's, there's all the, I call it facilitate, but it's really the platforms. So if you're going to build a community site like the Telstar one I mentioned or you know, Starbucks My Idea, something that actually facilitates engagement and is a place where consumers can post and react and comment with one another, 
Um, you know, there's a whole category of vendors that fall into that as well. And then the last one I talk about is, is management or, or, or social management. So this would be internal, you know, there, this is a huge category and I only just scratched the surface in my little diagram here, uh, but essentially um, ways in which you can take in feedback or use it uh, as kind of an intranet for your own employees to talk uh, with one another, um, you know, things like Chatter or Yammer or, um, you know, Get Satisfaction is a, is a more open one. You know, there's tons of these different types of platforms that you can use. So um, I just show you this because it, the, the, the opportunity is huge in, in terms of what tools are out there and just kind of sorting through. Um, my, one of my pet peeves about what others have done is they just give you a list. Here's all the tools that are available. But looking at a big list of social analytics tools or social media listening tools doesn't tell you what they do. And, and this was my first attempt. And I, I do still have visions of making this dynamic and doing mouseovers where you can click through each one and giving more detail. Uh, but this is my first attempt at saying, how do you categorize this stuff? Um, yeah, I think so one of the things that's, that's maddening is, like you said, it changes so fast. And, yeah. you, you know, you the bigger the company, the harder it is to change and to be agile. And you have to commit. And then all of a sudden, what you committed to is falling behind and there's something new and better. Mm -hmm. um, or new features, like, you know, there's all of these different things that platforms do. It's, it's hard to just stay current. Absolutely. Yeah, it's one of those things where, like with most technologies, the switching costs are pretty high. You know, if you if you pick a vendor, you know, you're probably locked into a year. And uh, once you start to use it and teach your teams and start to get up to date, you know, you don't really want to switch again if you if you can help it. So uh, it becomes a challenge. But uh, let me pop back out and show a couple of the things that I use on a pretty regular basis. Um, one of the and and I tried to go with kind of free tools just so that um, um, they're accessible to everybody. There's lots of great paid tools that you can spend tons of money on. Um, but uh, these are some of the free ones that I use that uh, I think are pretty interesting. So this is CrowdBooster. And CrowdBooster does a couple of things. So primarily this is a, a for Twitter. So what you do is you input a profile. So this is my profile here. Um, it'll give you basic stats, you know, the number of followers you have, how many mentions, how many tweets you put out, and whatnot. Uh, but the thing that's interesting about this is it actually, if you, so beyond scheduling, so you can schedule tweets to show up, um, you know, in the future. Uh, but the, the thing I like about this is it tells you how many retweets and the reach of each one of your uh, tweets. So um, this one, you know, so a tweet I did, uh, the, the way that this scale works, uh, going up on the axis is impressions, and going across is the number of retweets. But when you mouse over, it'll tell you how many people it reached, how many retweets, and how many replies uh, for each one of your different tweets. So for us, I think, um, looking for the one that announced this this um, this chat today. Um, but in any case, it, it's a, it's a way to be able to visualize you know, how many impressions you have and how far a tweet goes. And it also gives you this area here, the recommendations. So, you know, somebody tweeted to me a uh, question. I haven't responded yet, but it gives you the opportunity to respond right here from the interface so you can start to have a dialogue and figure out how far your tweets go and, and, and what, different things are, what different things are happening. So this is a tool. This is a tool I like. Have you guys seen this? Do you use this, Justin? I haven't seen CrowdBooster. I've heard of it, but I've never gone in and played with it. Is it specifically for Twitter now? So if I'm doing stuff on Facebook or some other network, I, I need different measurement for those? It is, yeah, yeah. So this one's Twitter specific. Um, one, one of the other things, I, and, and primarily I think of this as a, as a scheduling tool, so more or less to uh, schedule your tweets. And if you're, if, you're a, um, if, you're, if you're working to build a Twitter audience, um, obviously, there's tons of different strategies. One of my strategies is just to try to produce uh, high-value information. So I typically always share a link, or if I read an article, um, I share I, I share uh, information about that article. So you know, when I'm reading something at midnight on a Tuesday, I know that probably very few of my Twitter followers are actually online at that time. So I'll just bookmark it or, or capture a short URL and then schedule it to send out, you know, Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern time so that I know that I'll capture the, the biggest part of my audience. 
And, and that's why, you know, that's primarily how I use this tool. Um, and then you can also follow up on it as well to see yeah. kind of what's it, It's funny you mentioned the, the scheduling piece. I, I, I feel like recently I've seen information uh, about, you know, that there is definitive patterns and when you should schedule your, your, your publishing on social media. Um, and I've heard counter that it doesn't matter at all. I, know, I, I personally, I feel the former. I, I feel like there's definitely sweet spots during the day when I can get more traction. But um, have you seen anything counter to that? That there is, uh, that there isn't any. Oh, yeah, know, any yeah. I mean, there definitely is. I've seen, I've seen both sides of the argument. People will say, oh no, no. If you're in a, and particularly this generated from email, right? So it's like if you're sending out an email blast. You know, Tuesdays on Tuesdays, Tuesday mornings are the best time to do it. And I have seen research that says that's that's you know not the case. You can send emails at many different times um, that are still going to have the same impact. You know, one of the things that I believe to be true is with um, with Twitter. You know, it is very time sensitive because your audience is there. Uh, depending on how far back they want to look in their tweet stream. You, they may never see your tweets, and, this, and it's even more so more so with Facebook, right? With EdRank, you know, your tweets may never show up in somebody's stream. So I think the timing of social media is important, and I think that there are times where you can get uh, more people, more impressions, and more people to interact. And the the caveat there is, if you are using these scheduling tools, that you kind of need to be there to react um, when you do publish or at least be aware of it, um, because the worst thing to happen is if you send out a great, you know, great tweet, you scheduled it, and then people say, wow, you know, what's this all about? Tell me more. You know, what do you think? And they start want to engage with you, and you're out to lunch. You know, that doesn't help you. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't help your, um, you know, the, the credibility of being genuine and being human on social media, which, of course, is, is very important as well. Um, John, so, I... Just by the way, I think the Facebook promote. I just started doing some tests, and I think it, it comes to you know, to fight this exact problem, right? It's you you promote your post so that your fans they will see whenever they're live. So, so I think I, I didn't see very good results, and I've read some articles uh, saying that it's not really good. But uh, I think that's one of the things they are trying to do. To by this uh, problem. Yeah, but, and, and that's a fine line too, right, Daniel? Because you're using Facebook Promote implies that, hey, I'm going to sell to you at you know, 3 p.m. on a Thursday, or something that says, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this on a schedule, um, you know, presuming you're a brand or you're, you're some, s selling some product or service. You know, I think that the difference there is if you're an individual that's just trying to put out good information and there's no agenda behind it, that you can potentially have better, you know, better luck with it. But you know, again, it's all kind of that. Uh, how are you using social media? If you're using it to, you know, to sell or to, you know, indirectly sell, um, those are things that you need to be aware of, and, and they may or may not be be effective for you. What were you using it for, Daniel? What was the? Were you trying to drive people to your website, or what was the? How did you? Yeah, use so I was testing on uh, on uh, promoting a few posts on. Uh, to drive people's online behavior. So mm -hmm. when I publish a few posts, and so what I understood, what I understood from it is that whenever I promote a post, which is I don't know, five or ten dollars maximum, and then people, the people that like the page, they will see. I mean, it's not a promote, it's not an ad or something. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, taking advantage of. Uh, I don't know. They're just charging me money so that my fans will see. Yeah, I guess yeah. they're not putting it in front of other people, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the. So there, there is not like somebody who didn't ask to see or who never heard of you is getting these promotions. No, that have already no. liked you. And it's just people that like the your page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I don't know. I guess <laughs> we all know that Facebook's probably trying to desperately monetize. So uh, you know, they're probably testing the waters just like you are. Yeah. Uh, let me hop over to one more. If, if we, if you guys want to, I'll show a couple other tools. Yeah, that would be great. You know, and one thing, um, well, I'll wait to show them. But you know, the value part, right? I think uh, you know how how can we measure value too? I think it would be really interesting to hear about. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so here, this is another this is another one of the tools that I use pretty regularly. Um, tweet reach, and, and again, this is for Twitter. I was kind of going off the question that said, how do I measure retweets effectively? Um, so I pulled these up. But um, tweet reach has both a free and a paid version. And the free version of, of tweet reach basically go to the home page, and it looks like a Google home page with just the search bar. So one of the cool things about this, and I just ran this report, but I looked for dominoes. So you can see, you know, in a given time period, I'm not sure what our window is here. So I guess this is just today. Um, so in a given time period, it'll tell you the number of tweets, contributors. Um, it'll give you the account, the number of uh, accounts reached, um, and then the, the top contributors. So you know, if you're looking to learn a little bit more about your brand, your product, or your service, um, using something like this, you know, can be helpful to be able to get a first glance view of kind of what. Uh, what people are saying, how much you're getting mentioned, are you getting retweeted, um, those types of things. You know, this is this is something to watch. Uh, another one, uh, Row Feeder has got a, a free service where you can uh, you can enter uh, track different types of terms, and basically the way I use it is I actually populate a Google spreadsheet. So um, I I'm tracking some um, I'm tracking some hashtags that I wanted to follow conversations on. And basically, this will populate automatically for you, give you their username, the name, uh, the, the tweet, uh, and then some information about their friends and followers and where they're tweeting from. But if you're trying to follow a topic or a subject or something, um, you know, this is this is another pretty cool tool to be able to get an archive. Um, and they're going to cut you off with a free tool of how many you can actually collect. Um, I forget how many rows. Maybe like uh, 15,000 rows. Or excuse me. Um, 1,500 rows uh, is, is where they cut you off. Uh, but that's another one that's that's kind of interesting. Um, but there's lots. I mean, there's, you know, if you do any, if you do a search basically to get to, um, you know, look up uh, different types of social listening tools, you can find, you know, you're, you're, <laughs> you can find more than enough uh, tools to, to look at and to, uh, and to play with. Well, I guess the actionability of all these things, right, is to benchmark, right? So you, you did X, right? You... On Thursday morning, you posted to Twitter or to Facebook about um, an article, you know, about X, Y, and Z, right? So then to benchmark the activity around that post over a certain amount of time, you know, one hour, six hours, 12 hours, so that the next time you try to beat it, or if you're, if you're going to do a different piece of content, you can, you can continuously kind of improve as you, you know, try to spread more content through different social networks. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. Well, are there any tools that allow for that level um, of okay, analysis what, 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 there? Meaning, can, 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 is there anything that would allow you to say, hey, I'd like to see what this tweet did within this amount of time since the tweet, or is it more just a fire hose feed? Um, does that question make sense? Are there tools available that allow you to do what Justin is suggesting without having to manually go in and, and create your own benchmarking? Well, I mean, I think to a certain extent, like the Crowd Booster tool that I just showed would allow you to watch one of your tweets and how many retweets you get and how much, how many impressions you get of that. Um, usually, <clears throat> for me, what I do is probably take the, if it's important to me, if, if it's something I'm trying to track over time, I plug that into an Excel spreadsheet just so I can have a record of it and don't lose it, you know, in their time windows that they've that they've dedicated. Um, but that would be one way that you could do that. I don't. What else, Justin? What do you What do you use to be able to benchmark and track over time? Yeah. So benchmarking, whatever, whatever I've done. When I look at my historical data, um, you know, honestly, a lot of it's in Bitly or other shorteners that I've used to to go back and look at um, uh, when that when I tweeted that particular link and the performance around a certain amount of time. Um, but I don't have, you know, Excel. I haven't even kind of gotten that advanced with Excel uh, in, in storing stuff. I know some clients that do that um, and keep track of things in Excel, but uh, I don't know anyone that's using a platform that has a complete history and says, this tweet was of type X or categorized in these certain mm -hmm. ways, and this was the performance. It's, it's all much more manual than that. Um, but at least with, 
with the Bitly or or some other tool, it's got the historical clicks, and you can you, you know you can break it down by geography and, and time and in this in the UI. But but that's actually a pretty good question because more often than not, when I'm helping my clients with um, tracking and doing things, they've got a campaign, and if they're executing that campaign, like the Volkswagen example I use, if you've got multiple channels to be able to get the big picture perspective of your impact, you almost do need to track in Excel to be able to pull it together somewhere um, so that you can see, you know, what was the campaign, what what um, media assets did we use, or what social platforms did we use, and then what was the, you know, what was the result of each one of those platforms, and however you're quantifying result, whether it's click-throughs to your uh, web page, or whether it was, um, you know, generating awareness, or any of those different type of activities, being able to track that across channels, you usually have to aggregate it yourself in some way because I still haven't found a perfect tool that does it all yet. So I think a lot of the data that that you showed us, it was really good because whenever I've talked to users of Google Analytics or any clients, they always say that they're using social media usually in one of two ways. It's either in that upper funnel engagement, mm -hmm. right, trying to have conversations to stay in front of people, or it's that lower funnel where they're trying to monetize their groups, right? Maybe it's an offer that they're giving to their tribe that they have over here on social network X. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 to me, it's you know that the that second activity. That's where you can still use web measurement or you know website-based data to say, all right, well, what is the the monetary value? John, do you have like a formula or some way where you can kind of take that monetary uh, information and then kind of map it back? to all of the other things that you might be doing at the upper part of the funnel to say a reach read is worth this or a follower is worth a certain amount of, of money? You know, I, I haven't taken it that far um, because I, I haven't been asked of my clients to do that yet. and I'm not Well, you can tell me I'm full of crap if you want to. That's <laughs> fine, Doug. I, I, my family will be hurt. There's a lot of studies out there that say what's the value of a like and what's the value of a fan and... You know, for me, I try to de-emphasize that a little bit because, um, you know, your fans are going to be of different worth and different value to you, and depending on your objectives, you know, I'm, I'm a believer that um, social media doesn't always lead to a trail of cash. You know, your your digital objectives might just be having a conversation or just planting a seed in somebody's mind that when they're ready to buy, that you're a viable consideration. You know, so I, I I tend to be one that I don't say how do you get back to the you know the dollar at every social media activity, and for that reason I haven't said you know what is the value of a fan, what's the value of a like. You know what I do do is encourage my clients to track uh, what they're spending. So going for you know here's our campaign, and I, I look at it. You know one of the ways I've done it in the past is. Uh, I, I use awareness as one of my big categories. So, and I usually calculate awareness pretty simply. I just do um, uh, mentions times reach on Twitter, and then you do it different ways for different platforms. But essentially, coming up with an awareness calculation that says, you know, here's our campaign, and what was the awareness of that campaign, and how much did we spend on it? And in other cases, I've done engagement as well. Engagement gets a little bit trickier because you've got to figure out if you've got different platforms, what does it mean to have an engaged viewer. Um, but in any case, having some, I use a spreadsheet to say, here's the campaign, you know, here's, you know, here's what we're looking for in terms of um, awareness, and here's how much we spent. And then cost per, you know, cost per uh, campaign broken down by awareness will give you some gauge of, yeah, this was a mass marketed campaign, and it cost us a lot of money to reach those 40,000 people that we that we saw. Versus, here's another campaign that you know had the same objective, didn't cost as much, and we reached more people. Some type of comparative there to be able to look at what your activities are and to be able to measure them across the board is really what I strive for, rather than trying to get down to the value of an individual or the value of a individual interaction. Yeah, to, trying to normalize a group just seems absolutely insane. You know, it, it, you need to segment, right? You need to be able to segment like any type of data set and be like, all right, well, in this context of this campaign, this is what the value was to us. Yeah. 
That makes a lot. That makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, this kind of plays into, you know, something I've been hearing a lot about, and you see players like Salesforce.com kind of moving more into social. It's the whole social CRM scene, and the potential for that to be almost like this holy grail of social measurement, right? So, if I know literally who you are, and uh, you know, can I tie that to purchase history and these other things? What What are some of your, you know, what do you see happening there, and, and what are your thoughts about it? It's a burgeoning space. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing a lot, a lot of interest around that, um, particularly because you know most companies. Um, oh, I shouldn't say most. Many com- companies that do want to track at the individual level, knowing how their social profiles look becomes increasingly important. So again, uh, I've got this telecom example fresh in my mind, so I'm going to go back to it again. But um, you know, for for most consumers that have a service issue, product issue, uh, research shows that they're not going to go back to the brand. They're just going to tell their social networks, um, this product is not satisfactory and here's why I don't like it. So that raises an interesting challenge for companies today because they're not getting feedback directly from their own customers. Their own customers are telling their networks and telling other people. It's like you know, getting a bad seat on an airplane. You're not going to go call the airplane and say, this is terrible, uh, but you might tell your friends, don't fly that airline because here's all the things that they do wrong. So businesses today are recognizing that if they're listening to those conversations and can pick up or include what somebody says, whether they're a proponent or, or you know, an advocate or a detractor, and to build that into their profile, they can say, okay, this person has the, you know, the, They've got X plan, they pay the least amount of money to us, and they're complaining the loudest. You know, maybe if we marketed to them differently, we could make their experience um, slightly better, and they'd stop, or, or they, we could convert them from a detractor to an advocate. So, so, so you just said something to me that could be completely earth-shaking, right? If we can market to that person better, you know, and, and it's, it's, I mean, like now we're talking, you know, you might identify 50 or 100 or multiple hundreds of segments of, of people, right, and, or, or groups within your customer base or prospect base to target with different messages. And, and that's the thing, Justin. You just hit it there because in my mind, the way you do this right is you bring it down to the individual level so you know what the individual says, you watch their behaviors, you look at their profile, you learn about them, and then you roll it back up to the segment. So that you know, one-to-one, that's a tough way to market. It's tough to be profitable marketing one-to-one. But if you can recognize at the individual level what experiences are and you want to derive it based on some statistical foundation that you've got enough of a base to say this is characteristic of the segment, but to be able to identify uh, either actions or behaviors that are indicative of a larger group, then you start to be able to roll it up and market to the whole segment. And that's when it becomes pretty powerful. Yeah. So are we as a marketing industry and do we have the, the right tools and the right platforms to do these types of things now? To me it seems like it's we're still we're still here where we you know, we want to be up here. Yeah, you know, I mean in in my experience the the tools are there. You know, if if you go, you know, shop at any of the the big analytics companies they're going to have modeling tools. They're going to have the ability to do, you know, structured and unstructured data analysis. They're going to be able to get in and do the science behind the segmentation, uh, the network analysis, the 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 way that uh, needs to happen for these concepts that I'm talking about to become reality. I think the challenge is that you need a there's a couple things. You need a commitment in terms of an executive sponsor to be able to say, yes, we recognize that there is value in this. And then you need the people. You need the resources that are going to be able to, to do it and spend time not just cranking out another report that showed you how many visits and views you had, but to crank out a report that says, we can get out in front of this if we do these certain things because of what we know about our visits and views. And, and that's where the thinking comes into this. And that's where it becomes... Um, you know, pretty fun for, for analysts that uh, want to be on the cutting edge to say, you know, I have a you know, high degree of certainty that this is going to happen if we market in this way. 
And that's that's the evolution of marketing. That's where that's where this is going. Yeah, so we should make sure if any of you guys have questions that you have a chance to, to get them in. Anyone have a, a question for John? I know we've, we've hit most of the ones that were submitted. I definitely could ask more questions. <laughs> I, I wanna, Go ahead, Justin. I want to I want to know your thoughts on some of these black box metrics like clout and cred, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know they have a lot of traction, and and large companies are using them in interesting ways, right? You can get uh, if you have a certain amount of clout, you can get offers and deals that other people don't have access to. You can get better yeah. service from other places. Mm -hmm. um, you know, talk about almost the gamification of social media, right? It's, you know, if you do more, if you know more people, we're going to give you more stuff. So it's like ice cream and a seven-year-old. Um, what are some of your thoughts around, around those? It, for me, you know, it's hard to pay, peg one number to something and say this is what you are. It is. It, it's, it's tough. Um, so I go back to my old mantra, which is... Uh, Believe it if you need it, or, or leave it if you dare. You know, it's kind of like you know, it, it's it, in a little bit of ways. You know, if you need a number to hold on to. Wait a minute, wasn't that a Grateful Dead lyric? <laughs> Thank you. Maybe. All right. I just wanted to make sure that I did catch that. That was that's Box of Rain. Let's be specific here. Very good. Very good. I can't pull one over on you. But in any case, it's it's one of those things where you know, if you need a number, if you need to peg something and get a directional pointer, um, then those can have value. But like you say, you can game them. You know, if I wanted to boost my cloud score, you know, I could. You know, I, I could, you know, go out and, um, you know, and tweet more or, you know, whatever it is that I need to do to work that system to get a bigger number. Um, you know, you, there's probably a, a limit to how much you can game it, but at the same time, you know, you, you can improve it as well. Um, you know, I know that I could also... Um, you know, I, I can improve when I look at things like Twitterizer. I can improve my engagement score if I responded to more people, or you know, that when I showed the crowd booster, there was a guy who asked me a question and I haven't responded yet. You know, if I if I responded more or asked more questions, I could lift up certain scores. You know, there, there's always ways to gauge that or to gain those those types of systems. Um, I think that there is value in having some scorekeepers, if you will. Uh, what I don't like to see is a a pure monopoly to say that this is the only, you know cloud's the only game in town. It's good to see that cred came along and that there's some variation there. It does make it tougher for for marketers that to be able to say you know what should I use? Well you know what what matters to you? What's you know what do you want to look at? What do you what do you want to start following? Um, you know so I guess I take them with a grain of salt. You know they're not I don't think it's a definitive you know be all end all metric, but it is one way of looking at um, being able to say you know who's you know, who's, you know, who, who, where should I start? And it gives you a starting point is, is kind of what I'm, what I'm getting to. Uh, John, you mentioned a lot of different tools out there um, and suggested that having a, a central place to be able to pull information, let's say, into an Excel chart would be a good way to help, you know, bring it all together and move forward. Um, is there any process of of automation to that? Um, do a lot of the tools that you mentioned have APIs and ways that um, data can be pulled uh, um, in a more manageable way than having perhaps a, a team of data entry people checking checking CrowdBooster stats every so often? Absolutely, and that's a great question. Um, you know, there's most of these tools do have APIs that you can pull from, and and you can be able to get data. I mean, so like. Row feeder, for example, is is a is all APIs. Yeah, it, it's a way to get it out of out of Twitter. Um, you know, it, it just it's a matter of you know, for me, I'm not a developer, so for me to make a dashboard like that or to make a something that pulls and, and automatically updates, um, I, I would have to hire somebody to do that. You know, but if you can do it, if you're technically inclined. Absolutely, that's the way to go. So you don't have to pull manually. It just depends the resources and the skills that you have to do that. Um, you know. There's a lot of cases where um, I want to pull just a few numbers out of Google Analytics and include those in my reports, and you can do that on an automated basis as well. I'm sure Justin's got lots of tips and tricks to be able to get data out of Google um, to, to populate spreadsheets. Um, but absolutely, that, that's a great question, and it's it's a matter of you know throwing uh, just a few development resources 
and depending how fancy you want to get, you know, you can probably do that on the cheap uh, to be able to make these things such that you're not doing it uh, manually each time. Thanks. Yeah, you do that, Justin, don't you? You have or you have the ability to at least pull information from from Google and uh, populate on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. We um, we're of the opinion of we're going to make a standard API, and there's uh, such a great ecosystem of developers out there. Um, let them innovate uh, based off of the data, and I think it's kind of like what Twitter did with with their API, right? You have a nice formal API. And uh, you see what the what the community can come up with for tools and and uh, uh, other mechanisms to to automate common tasks. So there's Excel plugins, there's you know hosted dashboards, all sorts of stuff that you can use with with analytics. Um, so we're we're getting close to about an hour here, John. Maybe you uh, while we're wrapping up, maybe you could give us a, a few tips. Like what are some of the, the social media measurement uh, things that people should be doing? Well, whether it's a tool, a technique, or a process, what are some of the keys to success uh, that, that you've seen? Um, I guess one of, one of the biggest tips, and, and, and we've kind of talked about this already, is uh, make sure you've got a reason for, for your social objectives. Um, so if you're, if anybody at your company asks you, you know, if you're responsible for social media and you're getting ready to, you know, start a Pinterest page, let's say, uh, have a valid reason why you're doing that and be able to say not just, oh, we want to get more people there, but point, to, point back to one of those business goals and have a plan for, for how you're going to do it. You know, much of the work that I do is on that strategy side of things to say, let's think through why we're doing this, let's think about an execution plan for getting it done and make sure that you've got the communication vehicle in place to say whether or not it was a success. Because you know, my, my pet peeve is, and I actually do this as I drive around my town or wherever I am, when I see signs for, like us on Facebook, for let's say it's a restaurant or a car dealership or a landscaping company, I always snap a little picture with my iPhone to say, you know, what are those guys doing on Facebook? You know, are they actually, you know, trying to deliver more value? Do they bring, are they bringing business, you know, back to their companies? The biggest thing I could say is have a reason for doing something because, uh, the worst thing that can happen to you is to have a, a social media ghost town. So you put up a presence and then you abandon it and your fans come to look at it and they come to interact there and there's nothing there. You know, that's, that's a travesty that you shouldn't, that you shouldn't let happen. Um, you know, that, that, that's kind of the, that, that would be the big, the big tip is to, you know, have a purpose. You know, don't just do it for the sake of doing it. You know, make sure that you've got something behind it and hopefully that's got the, uh, um, enough legs to make sure that you sustain Awesome. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. Um, I, literally, I could listen to you all afternoon, um, just <laughs> talk about this stuff. It, 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 to me, it's really amazing, right, because it, it's all of this stuff is so new. It's changing so fast. Um, not only the tools, but, you know, the, the tactics and the strategies of how people use it. So it's, it's really, really, really appreciate you taking the time to share your experience to, to help everyone else out here kind of get a footing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. And, and and I don't know if we've got a couple of minutes left, but I'd love to hear from you, Justin, the latest on, on Google Social and what uh, maybe tell the audience a little bit about what's going on there. Yeah, sure. We uh, we can do that. Um, so, yeah, we launched a social analytics um, part of Google Analytics earlier in this year. Uh, I think it was in, in March. Um, but we kind of went out to all of our users and, and – you know, I know we talked to you as well, John, to, to hear how people are using social because we really wanted to, um, you know, kind of take your advice to heart and move beyond counting of the retweets and counting of the likes and, and focus on um, aligning social activity with value. Uh, and what we found were people were telling us two things. One, we're using social as an upper funnel type of uh, mechanism. And uh, two, we're also monetizing our social networks to... Um, uh, to, to drive more revenue you know, through websites, whether it's a, a transaction or, or a lead form or whatever it is. And so um, what we did with Google Analytics is that we have these social reports in the traffic sources section. And um, we categorize all of the incoming traffic that's from a social source. So we, we maintain a list of over 400 different social web websites um, on our back end 
and when someone comes in, we can look at the referral information and say, oh, they came from t.co, that's Twitter, or they came from Facebook, or they came from some other social network, and we can automatically identify traffic from social networks. So right off the bat, I think that's a, a huge plus for businesses because now it exposes that long tail of social that you might not have known about before. Um, if you have such a narrow view of social that it's Facebook and Twitter and Google+, Plus, um, you know, now all of a sudden, instead of three rows in your table, you might see 60 or 70 because there's traffic from all these other social networks. So we wanted to kind of expand the, the, what social is. Then we wanted to um, bring in kind of some of that upper funnel activity to help people understand how their content is being used out on these social networks. And so we, we have this thing called a social data hub. And this is actually a, a tool for developers where if you run a social network, no matter what it is, you can send data about what happens on your social network into Google Analytics. And a lot of sharing, obviously, is based on content. And it could be your content from your website. So if you have a blog or if you have um, you know, press releases, then um, you can take the URL of that blog post or that press release, and we can use that as a key to link off-site activity back to your web content. So, for example, Delicious, um, and Read It Later, those are both partners in our social data hub, and they send us information about what's happening with your content on their network. So people may never visit your website from either of these two entities, but your content might get bookmarked or it might get put uh, on Read It Later so someone can, can read the content you know, through Read It Later's app or something later. Sorry. <laughs> and um, so, so it's kind of like, what is happening to my content outside of my website? And that's, you know, to help people understand, it's getting bookmarked, it's getting shared, um, just completely out there in the ecosystem. And then obviously we wanted to capture lower funnel activity. So um, we took our, uh, our multi-channel funnel um, reporting and we applied that to social media. And so um, this helps businesses understand kind of the multi-touch um, process that people go through when they're converting. So, you know, John, you mentioned about how s social a lot of times may be broadening people's um, interaction with the brand. It may not lead to a conversion today, but down the line it might lead to something. So we can link someone coming to your site last week or last month from social media and then buying a product today or, or, or yesterday. So we can link that path together so that you can see, you know, well, it's just not direct revenue coming from social. It's actually assisted mm -hmm. revenue where social is driving traffic, um, you know, and then it's converting at a later date. So that, that's kind of how we want to get people to think about the value part of this is that, um, is that social media may not drive a conversion now, but it may assist in a conversion later on down the line. And that's, that's key, right? That, that ability to, and most of the way that I talk about it is not being able to do it in isolation, but looking at your social media and then how that draws back to your conversion events or your goals and on your website. I mean, to be able to, to link those two together is critical. If you don't do that, you're kind of spinning your wheels because that's, that's really where, where you start to recognize that value. Yeah, we still live in a very web-centric world, right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely evolving into app-centric. Um, quickly, uh, you know, the more people whose primary way of accessing online is, is, a, is a mobile device or a tablet, um, the app world is becoming more and more relevant. But, you know, it's that whole, that, that whole experience of what am I doing to this person that's ultimately going to get them to convert on my website. And so, um, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start to get even more fun where it's the tablet, it's the smartphone, it's the website itself, how do all those things work together uh, in combination maybe with social media and then all of your other marketing activities like display advertising or paid search. It, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's an exponential problem of device and exposure. Mm -hmm. so. It keeps getting uh, fun. Yeah, I know, exactly. It, yeah, it, it, I was going to ask you about that, Justin. What do you mean by fun? How are we going to measure that? It's like <laughs> print of black we'll cookies. Something up. We'll make something up, okay. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, I think the, the social media, I think, might be the key to the future, right? Because the more that it becomes a logged-in experience, right, the more your social identity 
is mm -hmm. used as the key to products and services. Um, it's like John said, it becomes individual marketing. We, you know, we can see you, roll you up to a segment, um, and, and then that becomes uh, a way to market people. So it, it, you know, job security, that's what I call it. Cool. Well, um, I wanted to, John, I wanted to thank you again. Uh, very, very appreciative of the time that you've spent with us. Um, if you haven't read John's book, you should go out and buy it, absolutely. We're going to post a follow-up. Um, John's got a, a link to his social media framework here um, that we will post uh, on the Google Plus stream. Uh, where we'll post this video as well. We'll post the links to a lot of the tools that John showed us. Um, and uh, if you're not following John or if you're not connected to John, make sure you do because, uh, you know, first-hand experience, the guy knows what's going on with social. So thank you, John. Well, thank you, Justin. It was fun, and, uh, and that's, uh, I'm humbled. Thank, thanks for the, <laughs> the compliments. Let's do it again. All right, we will. Take care, everybody. Have a great week. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.